Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Fighting Fatigue Together, Prioritizing Workforce Wellbeing for Enhanced Patient Safety. My name is Dr. Angelina Gapay from the Philippines, and I am a member of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists Workforce Wellbeing Committee. And I am delighted to be the co-chair today, together with Professor Beverly Ann Orser, one of our esteemed speakers. Today's webinar is part of the Fighting Fatigue Together campaign, proudly supported by the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists and coordinated by the European Patient Safety Foundation. This initiative aims to address the critical intersection between workforce well-being and patient safety, highlighting the importance of maintaining a healthy workforce to ensure optimal patient care. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that we have simultaneous translation available in French and Spanish. Please make sure to select the appropriate language room upon entering. If you don't select the right room, whether English, Sp French, or Spanish, you won't be able to hear the translations. Now may I introduce Professor Beverly Ann Orser, our session chair, Professor Orser. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Bev Orser and I'm the chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm also a member of the Patient Safety Committee for the WFSA and the past chair of the International Anesthesia Research Society Board of Trustees. So it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today. Um, and that is Mirka, Dr. Mirka um, Chialova and her presentations entitled Fighting Fatigue Together Campaign, Prioritizing Workforce Wellbeing for Enhanced Patient Safety. Now, Dr. Chialova, is the General Secretary for the European Patient Safety Foundation, the EUPSF, which is an independent um, public interest foundation, which is based in Brussels. The organization unites experts and leading organizations to drive uh, patient safety forward across Europe by involving stakeholders such as patient safety organizations, healthcare professionals, uh, academia, life science companies in all aspects of its work. And the EUPSF has developed solutions tailored to the complexity of patient safety challenges. The initiatives include raising awareness through campaigns like Fighting Fatigue Together, aiming to protect healthcare workers and patients from the risks associated with fatigue. And uh, their goal is to achieve um, substantial improvements in the well being of health professionals. So um, I invite you all to welcome Dr. Uh, Mirka Chilova. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Oster, for such a great introduction of, uh, of myself and uh, also of our European Patient Safety Foundation. And it's uh, really my pleasure to, uh, to be uh, today with you during this uh, webinar and share with you um, some details about our campaign, how we started, why we do it, and, uh, and where we are aiming for. But before we, uh, I start with my presentation, I would like to, we, we will start with a, a quick poll just to uh, get ourselves started. So um, please reply to the first question now. So uh, do you think that sleep deprivation affects your professional performance? Uh, if you could choose what you think, what, what which is the correct answer for you? And we will then show the results. Yes, we will show the results of the three questions. Of the one. three. Okay, so if you could please then now uh, select uh, your answers for the second question. Do you think that the lack of sleep affects your well-being and safety? And select the level. And you can also vote for the last question. Do you feel that you and your colleagues are supported and can encourage to maintain optimal health and well-being within your organization. And please select the level. Thank you. So we see that you all 
think, or well, the majority think that there is a huge, um, there is a significant or even extreme uh, link between your well-being and then uh, your safety as well uh, with your performance. Thank you very much. So this is a great start for our campaign and that also explains why we are doing it. Uh, so I will now um, share my screen. We'll try to find my presentation. Hopefully that will work. <laughs> Always. Mm. Okay, I don't see it here, but let's try. You, you can see, uh, we can see your screen. Yes, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, as already said, my name is Mirka Cikelova. I'm the General Secretary of the European Patient Safety Foundation. And uh, during this presentation, I will first uh, tell you a little bit more about why we campaign on fatigue, uh, then how does the campaign work, and what can you do if you are concerned about fatigue at your workplace? Uh, it has been already uh, greatly introduced that the our Patient Safety Foundation. So I will just remind that uh, we are independent foundation and we really try to work with national stakeholders in Europe who are active in patient safety, being in the front line. And we uh, are working closely together with them to develop our work and uh, one of them is uh, our main uh, thing that we do is annual patient safety conference where we really gather uh, all our stakeholders to discuss the relevant um, topics uh, linked to its patient safety. Then we issue quarterly patient safety newsletter where we talk about current issues going on uh, in Europe and also about our work. And one of our main um, parts or, or, or focus is the Fighting Fatigue Together campaign. Uh, so as you already selected the, the, the link uh, between fatigue, there is a clear link between fatigue and uh, your performance, but also on the, with the patient safety. And we are uh, convinced that uh, taking risks with the patient because of fatigue is not meant to be part of the job. Uh, if you also, you will probably uh, feel a little bit um, aligned with this picture. And we are also convinced that uh, chronic and excessive fatigue uh, is not meant to be part of job. So with our campaign, we want to protect patients. We want to protect, we want to ensure continuity of care. And we also uh, want to protect healthcare professionals because we are also convinced that taking risks with your own life because of fatigue is not meant to be part of the job. Uh, so fatigue, you will probably know the facts about fatigue and I'm not going to go into uh, details. So even if the fatigue is a, uh, um, uh, is subjective feeling of the need of sleep. There are some facts that cannot be denied and they are confirmed by, uh, by research. And there are some effects that are sometimes difficult to be recognized, som sometimes easy to be recognized, but they are there and they uh, have a huge influence on your performance and well-being and safety as well and uh, as on the safety of your patients. So how the campaign started? It started in 2015 by a tragic accident when Ronnie, a trainee anesthetist from UK, lost his life while driving home exhausted. And despite of the fact that he was singing uh, on his hands-free mobile phone um, with his wife, uh, he crashed, he had a micro sleeve and he crashed to the, into a lorry and lost his life. And his colleagues, they were very much affected by this accident and started uh, and decided that they have to do something and they have to act. And in uh, 2019, 18, the National Fighting, Fight Fatigue campaign was launched in UK as a joint initiative of the Association of Anesthetists, the Royal College of Anesthetists and Faculty of Intensive Care Medicine. So they developed um, joint statements, uh, fatigue, uh, um, FAQs, uh, some uh, practical resources. And uh, our and they also did um, a survey that just confirmed what we quickly did in our pool. And uh, our patients, European Patient Safety Foundation, we became backers of the campaign in 2021. And since then, we were thinking this is not this problem is not only uh, concerned not only UK and not only anesthesiologists. And we decided uh, to bring the campaign uh, in Europe. It took us a while uh, because in between there was 
So we had the COVID pandemic and the situation has um, became really difficult for, for most of you, for our healthcare professionals. And with our campaign, the main aim was um, to start uh, talking about the, this, uh, this problem, to start raising an awareness about the impact. And we really wanted to try to avoid bringing additional uh, burden or bringing additional feeling of guilt because of fatigue on healthcare professionals. So that's why we launched a call to join us with this on this campaign. And this call was aimed for not for healthcare professionals as individuals, but we aim and we still aim mainly for working directly with um, different organizations that they have uh, some kind of secretariat that have resources to build their own national campaign. So this is a short video to show you about our call. Fatigue is affecting the well-being and safety of health professionals with greater intensity and on a greater scale than ever before. This is leading to unseen levels of burnout, <clears throat> mental health problems, and people leaving the profession, endangering the continuity and quality of care in Europe. Let's face it, fatigue is only one of the symptoms of a deep crisis. The working conditions have become increasingly difficult. The limits of what is humanely reasonable to expect from health workers have been crossed. And the COVID-19 pandemic has just made things worse. We are all concerned. Research confirms the link between fatigue and patient safety. Health professionals suffering from fatigue are much more likely to be involved in incidents where patient safety is compromised. In some countries, healthcare workers have taken action to make their voices heard. They called for change. They went on strike. They threatened to resign. And yet they don't see any significant improvement. Imagine if we were to join forces. We call on all organizations working with health professionals on a European, national and local level to start fighting fatigue Together, together we can raise awareness of the risks of fatigue and its impact on health and performance. Taking into account the specific context of each country and finding ways to make everyone feel concerned. Together we can implement tools and recommendations on how to manage fatigue and improve the well-being and safety of healthcare staff. And together we can strive to go even further. We can advocate for more humane working conditions, allowing caregivers time to rest, time to grow, and time to provide safe care for their patients. Join us in fighting fatigue together. So we started the campaign, in, we launched it in April uh, 2023 in collaboration with our affiliates and, uh, and other organizations closely working with us. And then uh, we have we, we have now more than 20 uh, organizations supporting uh, the campaign. WFSA is uh, among among them. And uh, what we did, so we developed a website that you have seen because uh, the, the information about webinar was there as well. Uh, we made the video. We publish regularly social media posts. We bring topic of fatigue uh, and the link with patient safety in our annual conference. Uh, we work with fatigue ambassadors and we also bring this topic in the advocacy that uh, we try to bring on a European level. Um, and we develop workshops for national teams uh, and together with the national teams, we uh, also just uh, recently produce fatigue resource pack. So resources that uh, that are there to help uh, with, with this topic. And this all is uh, thanks to our sponsors, Medtronic and Edwards Life Sciences, because they support us from the very beginning uh, in this campaign. So uh, just after, well, a few months after the launch, we were uh, awarded uh, with, um, with European Health Leadership Award, which is really precious because there was a recognition of the need of this work. And um, uh, the, uh, the uh, right timing because, the, uh, because of the uh, ongoing healthcare worker crisis that is uh, in Europe, but also worldwide. 
But uh, so we were really proud about this uh, have, uh, being awarded, and uh, uh, we are also encouraged uh, to to work harder and to continue with our campaign. So the campaign, we know that it's a long run, and we are ready for it. Um, it uh, we are ready for few, well, several years, and the first year that we um, since the launch, we've really uh, paid a lot of attention for developing on the of the resource pack that could help healthcare professionals to start protecting themselves, start talking about fatigue at their, their workplace, and start to raise awareness about the impact between fatigue, their well-being, and then patient safety. Uh, and we will now start prepare, uh, preparing and working on the second year, on, on the second level, where we want to um, address this, uh, this topic and talk with uh, the management, uh, head of department and uh, hospital management to develop tools again and recommendation how the hospital and why the hospital should uh, uh, take a better care of, uh, of their uh, healthcare professionals. And we do it also on a different levels, uh, on the European level, where it's the European Patient Safety Foundation coordinating work, but we are uh, in close collaboration with other international organizations. Uh, but the most important part is the national level. So we encourage national organizations to work together in different countries to create national teams and develop their own campaign because they are the ones who have the biggest impact and they can do the change. And we have a beautiful collaboration now launched with seven countries and we uh, have the support of UK team because they are already running the campaign for five years and they have um, many experiences and examples what works, what doesn't work and can help with the national teams to launch their campaigns. Um, this is all with the uh, support of our ambassadors who are experts in uh, in the link between well-being and, and then um, mental health and other topics. Uh, and we, of course, uh, work with uh, closely with also our sponsors who are still supporting us in this work. Um, and then the very important part is the fatigue coaches, as we call it, but it's, those are all individuals who are leading the work in the hospitals. And for those, uh, we develop the pack because they are the ones who will lead the change uh, really on the front lines. So the pack that is now available on our website and it's available for download and you will receive the the download link uh, with the uh, with the email after the webinar. Uh, this pack is uh, intended for everyone concerned about fatigue in the healthcare and who wants to contribute to the change. It uh, has um, it contains tools and recommendations how to uh, start this work, and uh, we also have uh, few introductions, few warnings and recommendations. And I would really would like to uh, mention one uh, about not going alone, not doing this work alone. It's a long term. Uh, change work, which uh, requires a lot of energy and efforts, and it's one step going ahead and two step going backward. So uh, it is really hard to if if you do it alone. So we really encourage everyone if you would like to start working with the pack and uh, raising awareness about fatigue at your workplace. Please find. Uh, at least one, two, three colleagues that are also sensitive to the topic, start talking with them, uh, think together about what could work the best for your workplace. And maybe uh, our pack will help you with uh, finding some inspirations and some uh, good uh, ideas what you could do. So uh, part of the pack, uh, there are also posters that will help you to spark the discussions. And then uh, there are other posters that will help you with raising awareness about the risk related to the fatigue, the facts, the effects, and then factors impacting fatigue. And for example, uh, what is the link between sleep and learning and fatigue? Uh, and there is also the third part of the posters where you can, uh, well, uh, you can start uh, talking with your colleagues and changing uh, your own behavior uh, towards fatigue. So these tools should help you um, prepare better for your night shifts and uh, help you to sleep better, or maybe even uh, have you give you some ideas how what to eat and how to nap. And most importantly, uh, start taking care of uh, yourself and your colleagues before driving back home from uh, after, especially after night shifts. So. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope you will enjoy the fatigue resource pack. We will be uh, we will be really uh, keen to hear uh, feedback if you start using it. And please, you can also uh, reach us. There are contact details uh, uh, available, and don't hesitate to reach to follow us and reach to us if you would like to uh, collaborate or jo join the campaign. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you, America, for setting the tone of the Fighting Fatigue Together campaign and sharing with us what the European Patient Safety Foundation is doing in this initiative. Thank you. Now we move on to the next speakers. Our next speakers are Dr. Beverly Ann Orser and Dr. Tyler Law, who will present the human factors concerning safety. Dr. Beverly Ann Orser is professor and chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine at the Temerity Faculty of Medicine, University of Toronto, and the chair of the board of the International Anesthesia Research Society. She's a practicing anesthesiologist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center in Toronto, Canada. Dr. Orser's clinical studies and advocacy work focus on patient safety and the anesthesia workforce in Canada. She has co-founded several patient safety organizations and has made significant contributions to understanding the molecular basis of anesthesia. Her work has been recognized by numerous prestigious awards, and she is an international member of the United States National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Orser is a member of WFSA Safety and Quality of Practice Committee. Dr. Tyler Law is an assistant professor of anesthesia in the Department of Anesthesia and Perioperative Care at the University of California in San Francisco, USA. He joined UCSF as the first Global Health Anesthesia Fellow and is part of the HEAL Initiative Global Health Fellow. Dr. Law completed his residency in anesthesiology at the University of Toronto and holds a master's in science in health policy, planning, and finance. His clinical activities are based at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, and his research focuses on optimizing the interface between the surgical system and the broader health system. Let's all welcome Dr. Beverly Orser and Dr. Tyre Law. Thank you. Let me just pop the slides here. Okay, I think you can see that. Yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the human resource factors uh, and anesthesia safety. So human resources. And by that, I mean, uh, what are the things, the broader things that go into the, the origins of fatigue in our system? Um, and one of the important things is numbers. This is the, the problem of workforce quantity. And I ask you this because it feels like we're all working overtime. And I wonder if that's a feeling, I certainly know that that's a feeling I have. Uh, and I wonder if that's something that's common among uh, the rest of the group here. So one, ask, one can ask, maybe this is a real feeling and maybe that's because uh, there really are too few providers. If you step back and you ask on a population level, do we actually have enough anesthesiologists uh, and anesthesia providers to do the work? How many do we need? Well, uh, here's some data from the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, which I think many of you have seen, which suggests there are 20 uh, per 100,000 surgeons, anesthesiologists, and obstetricians um, needed per country um, or per population in order to provide care. And when you talk about anesthesiologists, we need five per 100,000 anesthesiologists. Well, how many, how are we doing? On a global level, we overall meet this threshold. There are 8.8 .8 anesthesia providers per 100,000 globally. That sounds great. Uh, as you can see in the blue in this map, there are many countries that have over 10 to 15 anesthesia providers per 100,000 people. Sounds like a lot, um, but I'd also draw your attention to the fact that there are a lot of countries with too few anesthesia providers as well, uh, which makes it, no matter what you do, the very difficult to provide the level of anesthesia service uh, that the population requires. But what about countries, uh, certain regions specifically? If you take a comparison, you look at the blue bars, you can see that the anesthesia uh, physician providers per 100,000. So certainly some countries are doing um, well, if you see in the European region, most, if not uh, almost all European countries surpass the minimum threshold. 
um, for anesthesia providers. But uh, take the same threshold in the African region, and it's very difficult, uh, and many countries don't approach, even when you consider non-physician anesthesia providers in the threshold. So you can already tell that starting from uh, the macro level, uh, it's going to be very hard to, to um, address uh, the anesthesia provider workload um, without an adequate number of providers. What are the patient issue, safety issues stemming from too few providers? Well, we can talk about a few things which are, I think we intuit um, already. Increased morbidity and mortality rates are certainly something that we anecdotally think of when we, have, uh, we know we don't have enough people. And we all feel this compromises patient safety. There's many ways I can show this, but uh, one that always makes me um, think of, and I, as you heard from the introduction, do a, a lot of global health work. So a lot of um, my examples are from uh, East Africa, where I do some other work. This is data from ASOS, the African Surgical Outcome Study. There's two points I want to highlight here. In this study, they looked at the mortality in uh, a group of African countries and found that in Africa, the the post-op mortality rates were twice what they were in the international study. You can see that in the all-cause mortality. Why? A clue might be in the human resources, in which in the discussion of this paper, they said they found only 0.7 providers per 100,000 and attributed part of their findings to these scarce resources. Secondly, I want to point out uh, that you can see that the mortality following post-operative complications was significantly higher than um, uh, the mortality overall. And one attribution to this is failure to rescue a deteriorating patient. And this really stood out to me, again, because this is also a lack of staff issue, but this includes the post-operative staff. It's an example how members all along the surgical pathway can influence um, surgical outcomes. Other patient safety issues are delays in surgery and prolonged wait times because of the lack of providers. Now, I might ask you, what country do you think would have this press release? It says shortage of anesthesia, anesthesiologists impacts delivery of surgical acute uh, services. More residency training uh, is needed. Well, you might be surprised to find out that this is Canada, where around there are around 9.5 physicians per 100,000 people supposedly well within the threshold. And this is because of a number of factors, um, but also because uh, of the shifting demographics in the workforce and as the anesthesia workforce, the, the uh, population uh, itself, um, as well as the geographic makeup of where the providers are located. And this is not an isolated problem. Here's another recent headline from an, a different Canadian province talking about uh, delayed surgeries due to anesthesia staff. And again, uh, a recent, uh, very recent from just um, last month in the NHS where um, a shortage of nearly 2000 anesthetists is uh, likely causing a, uh, a, a miss of operations in the NHS of uh, over a million operations. But this can have more immediate implications as well, other than um, delays to surgery. This is Malago National Women's Hospital. It's a specialized women's hospital in Uganda. It delivers, uh, have about 15,000 deliveries a year. Uh, as you can imagine, a lot of these patients require specialist care, including care from anesthesiologists. My friends and colleagues work here. We know firsthand that there are times when they're forced to be in discussions in which uh, among about which patient to take next to the operating room. For example, the patient with a newly diagnosed abruption or the mother with prolonged arrested descent. And these are difficult choices to make and they stem partly from the lack of anesthesia providers as they can only work on one case at a time. And there's not enough to take every needing patient at the same time. The patient safety issues include inadequate pain management and anesthesia complications. So again, I might ask you, if I showed you this chart and I asked you it might, uh, to guess what country would, might, would this be? So this is showing the proportion of uh, rural counties that have no surgeons or anesthesi uh, anesthesiologists, rural and non-rural counties. Um, and if we look at the percentages in the rural counties, up to 80% of rural counties had no anesthesia providers at all. Where is this? This is the United States. This is a country where, which has 
over 15 uh, physician anesthesiologists per 100,000 people, and far more than that if you consider the nurse anesthetists in the count of anesthesia providers as well. And yet somehow we have areas with no anesthesia access in the rural hospital. This is a problem of geographic maldistribution, where even if the number of providers is adequate overall, they're so heavily concentrated that services aren't available in other parts of the country. And to bring it into a, a specific example, this is the Navajo Nation, which is a, a tribal land um, in the United States. It's an indigenous area in the United States, which struggles to hire and retain anesthesia workforce. This is the hospital at Fort Defiance, and there are a small a handful of anesthesia providers here and access to services can be li uh, limited. What this means practically, these are the words of my friend and colleague, Sam Percy, uh, who worked in Navajo Nation, an anesthesiologist, who, who talks about how epidurals are only available for labor and delivery at two facilities. At facilities with labor epidurals, without labor epidurals, pain in labor patients is managed uh, with single shot intrathecal opiates and intravenous opiates. Barriers include anesthe increased anesthesia and provider workload, as well as other things which prevent labor epidurals from being adopted across facilities. So there are real impacts to the uh, lack of anesthesia human resources to patient safety and, uh, and uh, quality of care. Lastly, one thing we don't often think of is how the lack of human resources begets lack of human resources. Um, in this case, I mean challenges with uh, recruitment and retention. I have several colleagues, uh, friendly colleagues in Uganda, where we discuss workforce a lot. Here in Mbale, uh, we did training courses for anesthesia officers working in rural districts. Uh, one of them uh, talked to us about what thing was most challenging. She said, how she cares a lot about her community, an anesthetic officer, uh, and wants to be there for every mother who might need her during a spinal for C-section. But it's hard that she's the only anesthesia provider in her district hospital. Even coming to the training, she knows there's no anesthesia at her hospital and the patients would need to be referred while she's gone. Who wants to work alone? Nobody turns out. The lack of providers impacts patient safety by making it harder to recruit and compounding the other factors. So we did this study um, here in Uganda um, that looked at the factors affecting the decision to work rurally for anesthesiologists. And we see here in the top two important factors were how good the quality of care in the facility they worked in was. It was nearly matched by having the presence of a colleague. And these two outweighed the salary um, that you might think of as coming first. Turns out nobody wants to work alone um, and the lack of providers impacts um, the ability to recruit further providers. So again, there are a number of patient safety issues um, that uh, can uh, are affected by the lack of providers around the world. So quickly to talk about what we can do, some things that make uh, surgery safer um, is to uh, have more people and increase the number uh, and rely on our teams. This is verbiage from the um, AGBI in the UK stating that the anesthesia should have an assistant wherever they do anesthesia. Um, the group of team members is crucial um, in order to uh, increase safety um, at critical points in the surgery. And though it's a common model, it's not always to, uh, possible to find these people around the world. We have to consider physicians as pro uh, providers to share this load, but also include the assistance in the anesthesia team that helps reduce our burden, helps reduce errors from fatigue and burnout. Think about how teams can share the load. There are a lot of tasks we perform uh, and uh, lots of places to share or delegate. It's not always possible for a highly skilled physician to perform all the tasks. And as mentioned in the ASOS study, other parts of the perioperative pathway affect patient safety um, and the lack of providers in any step of the pathway can affect this. We must share tasks, allocate resources and increase training volume to increase to reduce our um, burden. Um, so I'll end there, but if you're interested in further workforce data, you can check out um, our new uh, release of workforce data here. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Orser here, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Tyler. Now I'm mindful of our time. So I'm going to share my screen, but really just jump to the bottom line because um, Tyler has highlighted the problems very clearly. Um, I'm hoping you can see that, but I'm going to speed yes, right we can. Now. Okay. Um, so just to let you know, in Canada, we have three groups of physicians, 
specialists who have done five years of training, family docs who do two years of basic training and then one year intense anesthesia, and a small group of physicians who provide anesthesia care in, um, say, emergency rooms. Now, we went to the Canadian Institutes of Health Information, which has all our national uh, billing data for insurance, to ask who's providing care where. And I want to skip to the bottom line, is that you can see that our workforce is plateauing. Uh, most are specialists, uh, about 15% uh, are family practice anesthetists and then other. But this isn't good enough because the population is increasing, uh, getting older, and physicians are working shorter hours, almost one day a week um, over the last um, five to seven years. Uh, in rural Canada, and Tyler's mentioned this, family practice anesthetists provide the majority of care. And this is our most vulnerable group. We found that not only is the workforce plateauing, it is now declining. And we're not seeing equal representation of females, um, even though the medical schools are graduating 50%. I'm just going to focus on this slide and then get into solutions with um, our last minutes. And I want you to focus on family practice anesthesia. Because the bottom line is the number of people we're training shown here is far less than the number of people that are leaving the workforce. So you can see there's a big difference in these numbers and most of those people are going on to do other things. This is a very challenging job. So just a few slides, what we've done at U of T, if you wanna scan the QR code, it's shown. We had a national pan-Canadian symposium uh, that, that collected ideas from multiple, multiple stakeholders uh, with the decision to make patient-centered uh, discussions, drive with data, and central is this notion of specialist general um, relationships. We're targeting rural care and trying to address the attrition in the current workforce. In addition to redesigning and expanding anesthesia care teams, our anesthesia assistants are a very important component of that. And right now the university has started new rounds for family practice anesthetists that are tailored to their educational needs and encouraging them to be integrated into our continuing medical professional education and our some of our uh, pain residency training programs and have established a new lead for anesthesia planning, at least in the province where I live. Um, so, so these are early days and interventions that we hope will start to address the workforce. In the larger centers, um, the redesign of the anesthesia care team is taking um, most of our attention. That is using anesthesia assistance and expanding our reach, obviously, as well as increasing the residency slots, but that is not going to solve our problem. So those are just a few of the initiatives underway at the University of Toronto. And if you want to uh, find more, you can, you can check our website at the University of Toronto, or um, re I refer you to that QR code. So I do see we're over time. So I'm going to jump to our next speaker. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Samia Madi Jabara, who's the president of the Levity Society of Anesthesiologists and a professor in anesthesia and critical care at St. Joseph's Hospital. She's a specialist cardiac, vascular, and thoracic anesthetist and is the head of the Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain Medicine at the Hotel Dieu de France Hospital She's held that position since 2017. She's had numerous leaders, leadership positions, program director for the residency, coordinator of various committees at the hospitals. And she's authored hundreds of peer review papers and actively involved in uh, patient safety well-being. She is a member of the WFSA's Safety and Quality of Practice Committee. So thank you so much, Dr. Madia Jabara, and I will hand over to you. Oh, just a reminder that the interpretation button is shown at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can have this uh, interpreted um, because she will be presenting. In, in in French, but all of my um, supporting uh, presentation should be in English. So I would like to thank the organizing committee that allowed me to participate in this event. The subject is extremely important. This is my session plan. So we're talking about fatigue tonight. As you know, it's a, a very common problem beyond uh, healthcare service. It affects other uh, very demanding uh, sectors, such as, for example, the aviation industry. 
But in our specialty, the demanding nature of anesthesia requires constant vigilance, which makes us particularly vulnerable to fatigue. And this affects our judgment and the patient, the care we give to patients. Anesthesiologists work relentlessly and they have a lot of responsibilities. And the real question is the following, are the sleep providers themselves in a sleep debt? And that's the question that I'm going to try and answer during the next 15 minutes. But before that, I'd like to talk about fatigue more generally. So what is a fatigue? It's uh, described as a temporary loss of strength and energy resulting uh, from hard physical or mental work. There are three types of fatigue. There's transient fatigue, which is due to extreme sleep restriction of between 24 and 48 hours. There's cumulative sleep uh, fatigue, which is um, more chronic. And then there's a circadian fatigue, which is reduced performance during certain nighttime hours. The etiology is uh, multiple. Um, sometimes is, is, some of it is due to uh, increased sleep needs, to age, to diet, stress factors, alcohol. So many different factors. So how are we programmed? Well, we have a circadian center in the um, uh, hypothalamus that uh, regulates um, several processes, like for example, temperature and hormonal secretions. Uh, the variation of light uh, synchronizes this circadian clock and we're uh, programmed for two um, lower vigilance uh, times uh, in the morning and in the afternoon and two periods of, um, uh, of wakefulness that are situated between nine and 11 o'clock in the morning and nine, 11 o'clock at evening. And as you know, this circadian clock is quite resistant to change. So when we work nights, uh, we often have troubles to then adapt to the next day. And that's really linked to fatigue problems. The surveys conducted by the National Sleep Foundation, which is an organization dedicated to uh, quality of sleep, uh, shows that we are a society of undersleepers. What are the consequences of this for both the anesthesiologists and the patients? Well, this study that was published in 1990, Gravenstein investigating the working hours of anesthesiologists. Um, a lot of uh, professionals reported that they worked 47 hours a week for nurses, 70 hours for residents. And they said that they worked beyond their capacity and almost all of them declared that their institutions did not apply any formal limits regarding the number of hours uh, uh, of work per day and per week. So since 1990, change have changed. Um, the European Parliament have put in place norms for regulating um, um, work shifts, uh, and that's 11 hours per day. And that doesn't mean that everything is fixed. In 2023, this study that was published showed that 73% of anesthesiologists suffered from fatigue, and this had consequences on their physical health, uh, their physiological uh, well-being and their personal relationships. So fatigue is a phenomenon that anesthesiologists cannot ignore. Fatigue concerns nurses, residents and doctors. This uh, Dutch survey published in uh, 2014 showed that nurses were twice as tired as the general population. And what's more worrying are the results of a large survey conducted in the United Kingdom in 2017 showing that 68% of residents reporting uh, that fatigue interfered with their professional and personal life and had negative effects on their physical health and psychological well-being as well. Landrigan in 2004 evaluated two um, um, shifts in uh, interns in reanimation uh, in intensive care. So those who worked more than 30 hours uh, um, made 36% more mistakes uh, than those that worked only 17 hours. Another uh, concerning result is that 80% um, uh, of respondents said that they had periods of micro sleeps um, during their shifts and committed a lot of mistakes linked to these micro sleeps. So how can we explain the fatigue among anesthesiologists? Well, anesthesiologists has a very narrow margin for error 
and we work night and day. Uh, we handle emergencies. We must be available with a regular and changing schedules. And all this requires a really sustained level of vigilance. So what does that mean, vigilance? Well, it's defined as the fact of being alert and attentive, especially um, uh, attentive to danger. And as you know, vigilance is a fundamental part of the slogan of several anesthesia organization. Um, and the American Society of Anesthesiology actually has incorporated the word into their seal. But keeping up this level of vigilance is uh, a real problem because it, it causes mental and physical stress, sleep defense, uh, deficits, and that actually leads to a lack of vig uh, vigilance, paradoxically. And if you have a look at this interesting uh, survey that was published in uh, 2021, 59% uh, of anesthesiologists are at a high risk of burnout. And this and 13% 30, uh, sorry, showed signs of burnout syndrome. And when you see the causes of this burnout, you can see there's working 40 plus hours per week that is listed as one of the causes. This uh, study that was carried out over 18,000 uh, doctors who were invited to indicate the likelihood of them leaving their current institution within two years because they're unhappy. Well, you'll see here that anesthesiologists are at the top of the list of people who wanted to leave. And something else that you need to know, um, after 24 hours of uh, uh, constant wakefulness, um, vigilance and uh, uh, productivity diminishes to uh, the same level as someone who has a blood alcohol concentration of 0.1%, uh, which is very scary. Several studies have also shown that working at night in an emergency situation has a negative impact on patient income outcomes. Surgery done at night is associated with more complications, and you can see in this study the burden of perioperative work at night as perceived by anesthesiologists. To the question, do you believe that fatigue during night work may increase the risk, uh, uh, peri perioperative risk of your patients? Well, 74% of respondents responded very much. The second question, do you believe that sleep deprivation affects your professional performance? Well, 71% responded extremely so. These studies have shown that surgery uh, carried out at night is associated to um, uh, higher mortality risk, not only uh, within um, the operating theater, but also in emergency services. Admissions to ICU, for example, during weekends are associated with higher risk of mortality, and this is independent of the uh, characteristics of the patients, of the type of surgery that's carried out or the type of anesthesia that is used. This study that was carried out in 2011, uh, carried out in a hospital in China, uh, and it showed that the um, increase of um, misadministrations uh, augment augmented by increased by several percentages uh, and this can be a huge problem as it can have consequences not only in the operating theater but also longer times in uh, recovery rooms uh, and a transfer to ICU. How, about, how bad can it get? Well the article published by Sina which is titled the tired uh, anesthesiologist is it a threat for patient safety. It's an article that was published in 2013 and that shows that sleeping six hours or less per night over two weeks results in a uh, two nights of uh, total sleep deprivation. So shifts uh, that are over 17 consecutive hours exponentially increase the likelihood of errors and fatigued anesthesiologists experience sleepy behaviors for over 30% of the time in a four hour case. And beyond that, certain studies have revealed that if the res residents worked 24 hour shifts recurrently, they're liable to make more mistakes and five times more serious diagnostic mistakes. And the most alarming fact was that 300% uh, uh, more uh, fatigue-related preventable uh, deaths were, were implicated. 
So I think it's time for us to act because in other sectors, this problem has been dealt with. You know, people who worked in uh, nuclear um, organizations, uh, aviation, they all have fixed hours. So now we need to take things into our own hands. So what are simple steps that we can do to avoid fatigue as anesthesiologists? Well, you need to exercise every day, even if it's just a little bit. You need to practice short naps. You need to uh, guarantee that you are sleeping sufficiently before you start your work section uh, schedule. You need to avoid a sleepy and tired start. You need to try to avoid uh, drinking coffee four to seven hours before you go to bed. You need to use bright lights uh, on the workplace during night shift. And if you think that you have any sleep disorder, you need to get in touch with an expert immediately. That's really, really important. And institutionally speaking, we need to educate staff about sleep hygiene. We need to encourage teamwork, which is very important. We need to propagate a safety culture. And we need to set a maximum of hours per week, a maximum on-call frequency, and a, a, a maximum of continuous duty period uh, under 24 hours and never more than that. So it's time to really wake up and to act. The lives of our patients is in our hands. Even superheroes deserve proper sleep and proper post-call uh, time. And as you know, being aware of a problem is the first step in correcting it. Thank you very much. As you can see my references here on screen. Okay, thank you to all the speakers for their insightful presentations. We will now open the floor for questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A box and we will address as many as possible. Now, I would like to start with some questions from the, which were pre-submitted. Okay, so among the pre-submitted questions, there is a recurring issue on how to fight fatigue and how to manage and maintain well-being in a workforce, in a setting with constrained workforce. And uh, another question was uh, how to maintain uh, well-being in a workforce where a, it, the place is a doctor-constrained, populous country, and uh, how to fight fatigue in a setting with constrained or few workforce. So this is directed to Dr. Law and Dr. Arthur. Mm -hmm. All right, Tyler, do you want to start and I'll, I'll jump in? Well, I, I don't have particular, I mean, that's a, those are intractable problems and I, I don't unfortunately think there's a good solution I can provide um, on the chat. I did uh, answer a couple um, questions in the chat already. Um, I, I just think that it comes down to, I mean, one of the things that I think will overall help on a macro level is trying to use this data to advocate for ourselves and our specialty um, to increase those resources because there is no magic bullet to reduce the fatigue, to, to reduce, uh, to make yourself feel less tired. Uh, we need more help and we need um, to show that to the people who can provide the resources to do that. Um, and I think that's one thing that comes out of getting us all together like this is to uh, raise the awareness for that so that we can advocate for more people to help us out. Dr. Orser, do you have anything? Yeah, I was just going to add the uh, or echo what you said is the importance of, of some data in this space as well, because we know, for example, in rural Canada, there was a problem. But when you have the numbers from the billings and the number of people who are leaving the workforce, that's powerful. And and uh, and so, we, first of all, we identified that it really is a, um, a bottleneck and a uh, an area of particular concern. 
um, the notion of serving our rural areas somehow hasn't hit the academic centers, this notion of social accountability, that we are accountable for what's happening in those rural areas. Um, so hopefully with these numbers, we'll see a change in attitude to say, okay, we think we're tired. Uh, I, I think those that are working in, in more constrained resource environments in, in our countries need to be um, elevated. They don't have the resources to collect these data. It's our responsibility to do so and help work collectively with them to come up with some solutions so that they can continue to provide service and we don't see the attrition in the workforce that we're seeing now. Thanks, Dr. Gaffey. I'll send it back to you. Okay. So there are also questions on regarding the um, how to quantify fatigue and how to decide cut, cut off level and how to decide fitness for duty again. Dr. Samia, you may want to answer this. Uh, yes, I think it's <laughs> very difficult to have a cutoff and uh, how to evaluate fatigue. I think there is symptoms of fatigue. When we have symptoms, we have <laughs> to stop uh, working. And uh, I think uh, 12 hours per day is enough <laughs> to work for anesthesiologist. And uh, one or call per every four day, it's the maximum that we have to do. And I think the teamwork is very, very important to avoid, uh, to prevent uh, fatigue. Okay, thank you. So, oh, here is another question, a pre-submitted question. How should we refer to personal colleagues when we detect signs of fatigue and psychological exhaustion without being misunderstood. Hmm. So anyone? I, I can make some suggestions. Um, the partnership that I work at at Sunnybrook, the ability to call each other out or correct or make advice um, only occurs if there's trusting relationships and uh, and uh, the, the, the foundations have been created to know that everyone's working together and that we're we're trying to provide the best care possible and and comments or suggestions are welcome and I think that comes down to the leadership of those organizations that they're open to coaching and uh, suggestions and um, uh, recommendations from their peers um, and and uh, so I think it's the notion that was raised before of, of a team, um, and not only a team of anesthesiologists, but our, our nursing colleagues and our surgical colleagues. That it's okay to 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 point things out, and and feedback is appreciated. And so if they see that their leaders uh, thank people for feedback, that that will set the tone within the groups. Okay, thank you. I, I would maybe add, uh, I'm not, uh, would do it from, from, from maybe uh, someone who has been listening. I'm not uh, really uh, healthcare professionals, but uh, we are working closely with the national team. So I think, and on the patient safety topic, so I think it's really hard to start intervening and to correcting the, the behavior or uh, speaking with your colleagues if there is no culture and if there is no awareness about the fatigue. So it's hard to do the, you know, the big jump from not talking about fatigue to trying to uh, correct someone or to remove him from the task if there is fatigue. So maybe the first part is to start talking about it, to start having discussions, to start raising awareness, and then together with the team, start building and thinking what are the most critical parts that we would maybe try to solve or we can solve already ourselves. Because it is the problem with shortages and with uh, lack of staff. This is not only uh, for anesthesiology. This it's, it's, it's not only uh, in Europe, it's worldwide problem. It's difficult to retain uh, healthcare workforce. It's difficult to bring new 
people in the system. So this will not be solved. So the, the first thing that you need to think is what can you do in your department level, on your team level, and how can you, you know, start protecting yourself? It's a lot, there are lots of things that you can do. And I, I may be an Nancy Redfern, she's uh, listening in our UK team. They could tell you small st steps and we try, we will try maybe to organize a new webinar about uh, what are the small steps that you can do to start this work? Because it is possible and she would tell you that yes, with small steps, but you can you can do it. And we would encourage you to first start raising awareness and to start talking about it. That's already gr great, uh, you know, first step you can do. If I can add something, but I will do it in French. Nous, au Liban, on a beaucoup de problèmes de manque à cause de la situation économique et à cause de la situation politique. Donc, les anesthésistes sont en manque et euh, ils sont fatigués. Ceux qui ont la chance de travailler dans un grand hôpital où il y a une équipe, Le travail d'équipe est très important parce que euh, on en parle de plus en plus. Et puis, il y a des secteurs en anesthésie qui sont plus faciles que d'autres. Donc, si un anesthésiste souhaite se reposer un peu parce qu'il est très fatigué, on peut l'affecter à, un, à, à, un, à une spécialité qui n'est pas très, très fatigante. Mais tout le monde n'a pas cette chance de travailler en équipe, malheureusement. Et vraiment, la fatigue est un vrai, vrai, vrai problème. And here is another one that we submitted. Can a standardized anesthesia practice help in preventing fatigue amongst anesthesiologists? So what do we mean by standardized anesthesia practice? Help prevent fatigue. We have to encourage the naps every day in the OR. <laughs> I would maybe oh, yeah. say here, sorry, I would just maybe say that maybe it's difficult to avoid the fatigue. In the current state, again, uh, of, the, of the system, you can't really get rid of it. The question is, how can we manage it? So what are the processes that we can put in place to uh, to make the risk linked with uh, fatigue lower? So I would just tweak the question is how we can manage this fatigue because we it, it will not be solved. Yeah, so strategies for fatigue management. I'm curious so, how many groups are looking at other allied health uh, professionals. We have anesthesia assistants that we... Um, rely on very heavily for our big traumas or our cardiac cases and so forth. How many other groups are looking at having allied health professionals come in to start to relieve some of the burden? Now in the US, we have the certified nurse anesthetists. In Canada, it's uh, anesthesia as a physician-based practice. But I'm just curious about what other uh, communities are doing to extend the reach of anesthesiologists so that they have some support in the OR. Uh, in Lebanon, we have nurse anesthetists, okay. and we have our residents of anesthesia also. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. You know, what, having worked in um, Canada and the United States, um, we also I now am exposed to the nurse anesthetist, which really increases the amount of uh, uh, cases that we can safely be involved in. Um, I think, but also, you know, we just completed the workforce survey, which I know a lot of you are talking about in the, the chat. This is the, the updated data to the 2017 survey. Um, and one thing that I think we would have liked to have captured more, um, perhaps in the next round, is not just the physicians and some of the non-physician anesthesia providers, but also other members of the anesthesia team, like um, our technicians, our anesthesia assistants, um, who provide a level of support, which really reduces the amount of effort I have to put into my day when somebody can help prepare equipment who knows how to help me in an emergency, um, even if they're not a frontline clinical provider of anesthesia, uh, it's, um, I think they're critical to our, our overall level of fatigue and pain. Okay, so we, there's a question on uh, what must the job givers or the hospitals do to help us against fati fatigue? 
I think we should bring it to a law or something. It cannot stay only what we may do, only that is ridiculous. So probably the administration, what can we do to ask the administration to for them to be aware about the fatigue and the, its effect on patient safety? So how do we convince the administration? We can show them the surveys and the studies. <laughs> so they saw that fatigue is really dangerous for the outcome of the patients. This is exactly the question that we, we are asking ourselves for our second year of the campaign. So uh, we will be working on, on this and we will uh, be developing a strategy how to uh, address the topics and how to make the hospital aware and what are the arguments that we should be using for, for, for them to listen. Because we know from UK um, uh, Fight Party campaign uh, that's been running now for five years, that uh, it was and it's still the, the most difficult part to convince hospital management. And that's why we are now uh, trying to bring to our team also uh, professionals from the other industries like uh, aviation, uh, railways and experts uh, in fatigue risk management so that we can uh, Thing together and also some hospital managers because who are already um, sensitive to the topic and develop the strategies and communication uh, for addressing this topic with them. So stay tuned to our Fighting Fatigue campaign and hopefully <laughs> we will bring some questions or some answer to your questions. You know, I, I'm wondering if folks have had any um, luck um, convincing the ministries of health that's the group that funds our residency spots and our postgrad offices to expand the residency. I, I really appreciate Tyler's work and the numbers that he's provided uh, because it shows that Canada is, is, is far behind the US and certainly far, far behind Europe. Uh, but have you had any luck expanding your training programs and getting funding for training programs? Sam is saying no. No, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I guess we have to, you know, form a very compelling, articulate narrative to expand the residency programs uh, based on data. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna have to campaign because uh, somehow the concern is not being heard. Mm -hmm. So any other issue? What are the other questions here? Oh, here there is one. <clears throat> I come from India and we are very far from 48 hours per week kind of working hours. We work 65 to 70 hours a week. And uh, as a senior member of the department, I have many responsibilities and I come back and complete my tasks. So it's, it's a problem for senior anesthetists who have uh, clinical work and then administrative work also. Do you want to add to that, Professor Orser? I was just going to say the um, one thing we're trying to do is, is look at attrition in our workforce. Um, Yes, we can train up more, but we want to keep the folks that are well-trained and very experienced in the workforce. And our senior people are um, are retiring and our workforce is is older and and uh, the average age is is increased in the last substantially in the last few years. Um, so at least in, in some of our centers, what we're trying to do is tailor the work for um, for our senior anesthetists to keep them in the workforce longer. So um, uh, modifying call, uh, modifying caseload, uh, recognizing age and not thinking that it's a one size fits all. I think we all come out of residency expecting a certain work pattern. And 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 in order to uh, sustain people in practice, we're trying to modify that in the more senior years and, and uh, find ways that we can find a balance to keep people working longer. This is in the, in the larger academic centers. 
so tailoring work, I mean, there's a reduction in income, but I think people um, sometimes leave because they just can't keep that high volume, uh, high workload pattern going into their more senior years. Yeah, I agree. Now, here in the Philippines, the problem is the younger ones don't want to go into residency training like anesthesia and even in other specialties because they just want to to go and work a certain number of hours. They call it uh, moonlighting. So the residency, we don't have enough residents. So mm -hmm. that's it. Well, I must say that's not a problem in Canada. Anesthesiology is an extremely popular specialty. Um, it's it, it gets far more applicants than um, positions. And I think, Tyler, it's the same in the U.S., that the medical students are very interested in anesthesiology. I think sometimes they mistakenly think it's, quote, a life, lifestyle specialty. Oh, how wrong. But, but um, it is very popular right now. Okay. So there is there are two questions here. What do you take as uh, suggest taking uh, supplements? What type of supplements to fight fatigue, and what type of exercise to do to fight fatigue? Merka, can you tell us? I wouldn't say I'm the best uh, person to uh, to reply because, as I already mentioned, I'm not a healthcare professional, and I'm uh, personally really um, very sensitive to uh, to sleep deprivation. So um, I'm really not the right person. I really need eight hours of sleep and uh, some naps on the top. So uh, uh, I would suggest other speakers to to reply to this question. Or Samia. I don't know, maybe uh, vitamin C, maybe, I don't know. But if we can, uh, uh, in the morning, run 15 or 30 minutes, I think it's really very, very good. I used to do this uh, for many, many years, and uh, it's uh, it gives us a, very, a, a good push. So mm -hmm. uh, running or, uh, or walking in the morning, like 5 a.m., 5.30 a.m., is really very good. Mm -hmm. And the naps are very good in the afternoon. We don't do this, but I think it's very good. <laughs> Is there a staff fatigue monitoring system? Does it exist? I don't think so. <laughs> there are some applications uh, that, that were already tested for this purpose, but there is um, a, a big problem with uh, what to do with, uh, with the information. And then there is also a huge concern about uh, if there, if we know if there is a fatigue and there is a medical error, and um, and uh, so who is responsible and so on. So that's a very difficult question. We were thinking about uh, bringing such a such a tool in our campaign, but we still didn't come to a conclusion which one and uh, how this could be used so that it's safe for uh, healthcare professionals and it will give them the information but also uh, not create additional problems. But there are some applications that are used also for truck drivers or for some other, uh, and we could uh, maybe search for, uh, I can search for some, uh, some information about it and add it to our website. Mm -hmm. We still have the Q&A box is there any advice regarding the workload that should be accepted by the head of department mm -hmm. <laughs> very difficult question <laughs> from uh, in low middle income countries what uh, we should adopt hybrid models in uh, lmics to help reduce fatigue that is have physician and non physician anesthetist working hand in hand so neither group overwork 
Is it going to be impossible to have physician anesthetist to staff all the work we do? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the model we're going to be looking at as well. Uh, and and the CRNA model is, um, as Tyler mentioned, um, more effective and, and, uh, and we're looking to grow something similar. We have the structures in place now and just expand that. Okay. One thing that I think is important to think about in your interference, your model, is like there are very conflicting studies on whether or not uh, CRNAs uh, in the United States increase access to care. Um, and that's partly because of the same reason is that every human being wants to work where there are other human beings, including CRNAs, and they don't, and people don't want to work in rural areas. Um, and so I don't, we still have to think about that question of geographic distribution and what are incentives to, to help people come out of the cities um, and, and live, have a meaningful live and work environment uh, in places that need their care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think uh, our time is up. And uh, Professor Orser will have the last uh, message. Right. Thank well, you I just, for all the questions. Well, I want to thank our audience and um, all the presenters, our interpreters, and our leaders, Dr. Gappe. I want to acknowledge Dr. Orasian, who's the uh, chair of the Safety and Quality Patient um, Practice Committee. Um, lots of great information today. Thank you. Um, the tools that Mirka suggested, I'll be probing. Really appreciate all the hard work you're going. Tyler, your data is very helpful. Uh, we're using it as ammunition to try and get uh, the specialty resourced. And Samia, thank you for reminding us of the physiology and the importance of, of fatigue. Uh, this is an international problem that we as a community are going to have to address. And as Mirka said, nobody does this alone. I want to thank the WFSA for pulling this seminar together. And I look forward to working collectively with everyone here to, to address, address this problem on behalf of our patients. So thank you for joining us. I'll hand it back to Gape, Dr. Gape. Thank you. Uh, Rosa? Yes. Rosa? <laughs> uh, I just want to thank you all. And everyone will receive a link to the recording in about 24 hours. So you can rewatch this session. Okay. okay. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.